I don't know how he did that before he got it's saved. It's like this. Watch. Whoa. Wait, oh. can I do that too? <laughs> do you have a Mac? Uh, no. That's so unfortunate. Oh. That was so cool. Wow. I, we, we also, I don't know if this will do. Like, this one does this too. This is a really fun way to start the podcast. Okay. Wow. Um, did mine work? <laughs> Why is yeah, you're working. It, it's like really you weird. You have to like go outside like this. I don't feel like, like it's very consistent. I don't know how consistent it is. Like, for instance, uh, ah, I think there we... it is. There it is. Okay, that wow. was this so one's cool. fun too. Anyway, yeah, Mac. I don't know why they put in these features. That is That's so amazing. cool, Betty. This is um, this is what it must feel like to have like like an Android if you don't have an iPhone. Like, I'm just missing out on so many features right now. Um. Yeah, yeah. The silly when people here. when people text me and they have the green text shows, I'm like, Jesus, oh man. Um, yeah, yeah, you are speaking our language. Get an iPhone, everyone. Right now. You are get an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Um, that's funny because I'm married to a green bubble. Oh but my god, it's the worst. Especially the group text. The group text is the worst. You like get like, um, when like people like reply message or like they like the reactions to it. That's the worst. You get like mm-hmm. four messages. Um. They did fix yes. that though. They fi- yes. they made it like more compatible, so you don't get those. Anymore. Okay, well, I'll take your word for it. I've yet to um, experience that, but yeah, I, I, iPhone's the way to go when it comes to that iMessage. I think they definitely took the monopoly on that. Um, I agree. But anyway, today I'm really excited to be joined by uh, Nina Howard and Anna Lowe, who are from the Basically Doctors podcast, and so this is going to be a super exciting episode today. Um, we're going to talk some chemistry. And we're just going to have fun. So join us along for the ride here. And then, you know, also be sure to check out their podcast as well. Cause I really think, I mean, I got to give your flowers here. I mean, I think your podcast is super unique. Um, we've talked about this before in the age of podcasting. It's really great to hear. I mean, really from women in STEM and like your personal experiences. I think that's a, a valuable resource. So be sure to check them out, but yeah, just so just on your podcast. So basically doctors, and uh, I, I, I'll let you guys take the floor here a little bit. Maybe give us a little bit of insight on the inception of your podcast and kind of what your goals are for that. Anna, do you want to take it away? Wow. Um, yeah, I'll take it away. So, well, I want to add, first of all, like I'm kind of excited about this episode release with you, Aiden, because like we obviously had just recently recorded an episode with you for our podcast. So I'm hoping that like the release timing of these two episodes will come out around the same time. If that is the case, please, like after you listen to this podcast, feel free to go over to our channel and listen to our podcast with Aiden as well, where we kind of like you know, we ask Aiden a lot of the same questions that Aiden's asking us this episode. So if you've really been a long time listener of Aiden, like, and you want to know more about his process, like, I encourage you guys to go over to our channel. Um, Basically, basically doctors, um, that is a name that we chose for our podcast, because when Nina and I decided to start the podcast, we were kind of very fresh out of graduate school. And we were kind of reflecting, doing a lot of kind of internal (laughs) reflection on our experience and the fact that we're currently now basically doctors, you know, and essentially how do we navigate the identity of, you know, when graduate school was such a huge part of our lives and you're very much so a student, you're very much so learning, you're very much so kind of very like under development. And now we're supposed to be like full grown adults (laughs) in the real world with our degrees and, you know, um, doing that. And initially, the goals of this this podcast was to, you know, be a source of, I think, advice and a resource to, you know, young professionals, essentially, or people who are looking to become graduate students at the undergraduate level, to shed some light on kind of what the process is, what graduate school is like, and essentially how you would apply that into you know, the quote unquote real world or the professional world, wherever that may be for you, either it being in academia or an industry or whatever, because I think Nina, Nina's strength in the podcast is that she is such a, you know, resource, self-help guru, in addition to being like an amazing educator, you know, she's thought so much about education in the context of STEM, specifically chemistry and I felt like she had such good, like, knowledge that in a podcast format would be awesome to translate to people and just to, like, you know, give people, like, 
the knowledge that I did, I certainly didn't have. I didn't seek that information out. So um, I think that's what she definitely brings to the podcast. And I don't know what I bring to the podcast. I bring, I bring a sounding board. <laughs> I bring a sounding board. I bring, I think, a different element to it because Nina is a very type A person. She'll go out and find all the information before she makes a decision. And I'm like you, Aiden, a chaotic. The vibes are up. Kind of. We're here feeling the vibes and going with the vibes, yeah. you know? And I feel like that, uh, we, we talked about it and we felt like that represented maybe two, you know, important contrasting sides and perspectives um, that would be valuable to an audience. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to stop here and let Nina add <laughs> or edit anything that I just said. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. No, you know, here's the thing. This is what Anna brings to the podcast. Anna brings a different perspective that... I don't have and that I had to learn how to work with while I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Because like Anna said, I try very hard to be, you know, organized and type A and like very, you know, I try to be very linear with the way that I do things. But I think what Anna brings to the podcast and what she's brought to my life specifically is learning how to be open to more paths than just this one linear path that I have always followed. And so she brings a lot, obviously, to the podcast. I I do do a lot of research and learning about better ways to educate and different ways to be productive and always trying to kind of like better the way that I live my life. I'm trying to optimize my life in some ways. And I think Anna brings the side that like, you don't actually have to optimize your life and you're going to do just fine. <laughs> but the what, what? she's doing great, objectively. Um, but... <laughs> So what? It's true. Uh, But for me, the reason that I wanted to start the podcast is really just, I wanted to create a podcast that would have been something that I found valuable when I was in graduate school. So I had all these questions. People gave me so much advice. I have all those things in my brain. And I wanted to put all that information somewhere so that other people could learn from our mistakes all of the things that we've learned from other people, all the resources that I've sought, because I've sought a lot of advice and resources from people. So really just putting it out there. And also, I think we talked about this in our um, episode as well, but selfishly, I moved across the world, basically. And so it's a way. (laughs) Yeah. I I live in Amsterdam now. And so Anna and I selfishly want to keep in touch. And it's a way to do it. You know, bounce ideas off each other like we always have so it's um I mean not to get all sentimental on the main podcast but it's truly like okay yes all of the things that Nina and I just said in terms of like factually what we want the podcast to be but also I really view it as a love letter to our friendship because Mm. I was just talking to Nina about this I knew that would get you like I knew that she's such a sentimental anyway anyway I knew that would get her but it is because like I was talking to her about it. I was like, honestly, even if the podcast doesn't become successful, even if we don't get like a lot large audience, you know, number one, if one person listens to our co- podcast, we're happy. Um, but number two, like we do this and I think about things like, it, you know, 30 years down the line, I hope that Nina and I can look back at some of this and it's just a record of our relationship. It's a record of our history. Like we get to see our friendship again. Like, I mean, you don't get a lot of opportunities to do that with some of your closest friends. So I'm really like, that's inherently so valuable to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's just my little sentimental. Well, I definitely could attest to it as someone who's got to know you guys briefly, but what you guys have is like lightning in a bottle. I'm telling you guys right now, like it's, it, you guys have really <laughs> captured this and you guys really are like the yin and yang. I mean, it, it works really well. I mean, as, as an outside viewer listening to your podcast, um, yeah, I mean, when I listen to you guys, when I'm at the bench top, you know, I, I hear your, I hear your advice and I hear your stories and it's like, I, I, I connect with it. So you guys are doing great things. Um, and yeah, I Thank think, you. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's wonderful and, you know, keep going, I think. So, um, it's really exciting to see within, I mean, and we've talked about this before, but this is the kind of content I think that is needed for particularly the, I would say STEM and even just like chemistry community. I don't really, I don't really know of another, uh, like people talk chemistry, let's say like farm to table, another pocket. I mean, that's really, that's really kind of it though. Uh, there's no like, um, 
personal stories, I would say. Um, that, that's just, but that's my own opinion on that. Take it for what it's worth. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, getting to it t- today then. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk, uh, well, more about your backgrounds. So <laughs> I guess like Nina mentioned, you are now living in Amsterdam, but you were a graduate student at UC Davis, where I guess you overlapped with where, or I know you overlapped with Anna at UC Davis as well, working with, oh man, Professor, uh, Jared Shaw, I think, right? Um, yep. And so. Good memory. Mm, well, I do have your LinkedIn pages right here. So, you know. <laughs> that's, nice. Be transparent. Tell him. Yeah, tell listen, him. Listen, quick plugs to, to follow us on social medias. <clears throat> no, but, um, but yeah, so uh, what I was going through, because I, I needed to see like what, what kind of chemistry you guys do. Like, so I was going through it and, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I'm looking on, I'm looking on here. So, well, okay, broadly synthetic organic chemistry, but perhaps so for Nina, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Castaglia Cushman reactions, and then <laughs> the Castaglia Cushman <laughs> reaction. Wait, no, it's the Castaglio Cushman reaction. <laughs> now we're never, we're never changing it. No, it's the it's a weird name. Nina, the please cast- take it away. <laughs> it's fine. It's the Castaglia Cushman reaction. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I'm like, is this a? I think that's Italian, but um, an Italian last name. I think so. I don't know. I don't know. And, but then your guess is as good as ours. Yeah. Um, but and but you also worked on well, also organic chemistry, but like working with kind of entosyl amines, broadly speaking. Um, so I'll let you guys kind of take the floor here about maybe your graduate research perspective, like um, experience from a synthetic point of view. Um, cause I'm, I'm sure I definitely, this is something we didn't, haven't talked about yet. So I definitely want to hear from you guys about your, um, your chemistry and your graduate students. Nina, why don't you go first? Okay. Okay. So in brief, so the Cassinelli cushman reaction is broadly the reaction of imines with cyclic enolizable anhydrides to form lactams. So Our group has been working on different variants of the Castanelli-Cushman reaction for a long time. Jared's kind of claim to fame or really what brought him into the Castanelli-Cushman sphere was what we call the four-component reaction, which is a one-pot, four-component Castanelli-Cushman reaction where you form both the imine and the reacting anhydride in situ. Uh, And so I basically was working on offshoots of that reaction for most of my PhD. So... Basically, uh, I guess you could say that, I mean, how in detail should I go? I mean, that's effectively, I worked on the castanelli cushman reaction and its variants during my PhD is, is the we can go. Summary. We can go in deep as we want. Let's go. Let's, let's go down. <laughs> let's, let's drive to the deep end. I don't end. know how deep everyone wants us to go, though. I don't know how many people really, really need to know about the castanelli cushman reaction. Well, I mean, I, I guess you could briefly describe what it does, and then maybe it's synthetic importance broadly? Uh, yeah. So basically the, the idea is one thing that we found really interesting about this reaction is that anhydrides are typically seen as electrophiles. Mm. You know, when you're learning about them in sophomore organic chemistry, you're usually thinking about isolating, like using them as isolating reagents. But the idea with uh, cyclic enolizable anhydrides is they are anhydrides that have a more, um, acidic, proton at that uh, alpha center or the alpha to the carbonyl, which allows them to act as nucleophiles rather than electrophiles. So we're kind of switching the uh, reactivity of what we usually think of as electrophiles to nucleophiles. And so in that way, we use this cyclic enolizable anhydride to react with an imine as an electrophile in the reaction. And then once you form that carbon-carbon bond, you can actually then do an intramolecular isolation to form lactams. And depending on the size of this anhydride, you can form different sized lactams. And so the reason that we, you know, like to say that this is important is because obvious, well, not necessarily obviously, but uh, lactams are commonly present in many natural products. And a lot of these have medicinal properties. And so, you know, conceivably we could think that this is an important reaction that people could potentially use to make molecules. And in fact, Mark Cushman, who is the Cushman of the castanelli cushman reaction, um, he has a topoisomerase inhibitor based on the castanelli cushman reaction that uh, is in like, I think, phase two clinical trials. So there is importance. This reaction does have importance, but 
it's basically a, another way to make lactams. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, a warrior because I'm, I'm kind of just like looking at the abstract right now. Um, any mm-hmm. any comments on maybe substrates that aren't really good for? Because I'm seeing are they were they activated? I guess by like the benzene backbone or the aromatic backbone, or is the, it the oh yeah? So the anhydrides, yes. Yeah. So the best anhydride for these types of reactions is homothalic anhydride, and the reason for that is it has a well in, conceivably the reason for that is because the uh, alpha proton is what I'm just being like, you know, I've done, Anna and I have talked so much about the mechanism of this reaction because we're working on an organic reaction chapter, which is, I don't know if you're familiar. It's I didn't like, want to bring it up, the, but here we go. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> time, I no, I, I, I was chatting with um, Aiden yeah. about our, uh-huh. our, uh, one of our current projects right now, which is working on this book chapter. And so I kind of gave him like a background on the process and what the text <laughs> is. Um, yes. But take it away and continue <laughs> with what you Yeah. So say. we've talked so much about this mechanism. Basically, the my um, paper from graduate school where we di- I dived into the mechanism or dove into the mechanism of this reaction, um, it was really, I mean, I found it interesting. Anna and I talked a lot about how to kind of reconcile all the previous results, which will be in our chapter if it's not cut, because we'll see, or we'll publish it separately. We don't know yet. Um, But so homothalic anhydride is a really good substituent or uh, reactant for this, for the castanoli cushman reaction, because that proton, when you deprotonate it, if you look at it, it actually has an aromatic substructure. So it's a highly acidic proton. Mm -hmm. It's more acidic than you would expect it to be, uh, just like kind of at looking at it because, but once you deprotonate it, you have this entire conjugated system. And so it uh, allows for that analyzation to happen very easily. Mm. And so it makes it better at doing the reaction. Um, and typically in these reactions, um, the base uh, that is deprotonating is the imine. So you're forming an iminium ion intermediate, mm-hmm. but this can actually, it's either a full deprotonation where you're deprotonating the anhydride, or you kind of have this, the enol intermediate that is um, interfacing with the imine, like with, through hydrogen bonding. Yeah. So there's, there's a bunch of different transition states that you can draw depending on what the substitute or what the um, reactants are. So there's kind of a lot of, compl- there's shockingly a lot of complexity to this reaction, which is why Anna and I have had so many conversations about it, but it is pretty I, interesting. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's as shocking as, I think it's shocking because like we're at a level now where we've looked at the reaction so much that we are very desensitized to it. So I don't Mm -hmm. think it's unusual that it's the case. Like, and to add on to that, I I don't think I've run a single CCR. We, the abbreviation for for the Casanova Cushman reaction, which I will be using because, (laughs) and you can use as well, Aiden, because you do not have to say the names. Um, which is so, the same as that band. What is it? The the Credence Clearwater Revival? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Anyway. Um, oh, which head. is an amazing band. Mm. Um, <laughs> gosh, you need to listen to uh, Aiden. Poor we need to educate oh, you. God. Just kidding. Um, I don't think I've even listened to them. Anyway. <laughs> I cannot believe you guys haven't listened to them. They are a classic. You guys are outing yourselves on this podcast right now. People will come for you. Okay, okay. so. I'll take it in my DMs. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> So I've never run a CCR reaction before. So in a technical standpoint, I really don't know the te- technical components of the CCR. I just know it a lot because, again, this is something that my PI uh, or, our, or our former PI has worked extensively on and kind of broadened in terms of its utility. Um, my understanding, it, it, you know what it's cool about? What's cool about it as like a first year in graduate school or as somebody who might not have interacted with it? It's a formal cyclo edition. So it yeah. It, you're creating actually more than just a single bond throughout the course of this reaction. It can be highly diastereoselective, selective and it results in really highly substituted lactams. It's not just you have the naked lactam, right? That's true. So yeah. like in that way, I think the synthetic utility of it is enormous. It gives you functional handles on the lactam for you to do subsequent transformations. Um, not, not, not me explaining Nina's research, I know, but I'm like, I have to, I have to, because I have to, because yeah. the thing is, the thing is, once you get to your fifth year, like uh, people generally are in the habit of underplaying what they did because you look back and sometimes you just get into a space where you're just like, oh, like, is this all I did? Like you get into kind of a negative mm. space and you, you can't see, you know, 
all of the little things that you've contributed, all of the valuable things that you've contributed. Nina worked on a total synthesis project when she was in our group that utilized mm -hmm. the CCR in a key transformation. So she is familiar with the applications of this. Um, in addition An to developing the total synthesis. An yes, unsuccessful but, total synthesis using a variant of the CCR, using uh, siloketine acetal instead of an anhydride. So anyway. <laughs> um, yes, but let's, um, are we going to get into the fact that most total syntheses end up being unsuccessful? Are we ever going to talk about we that? We could. Like, I mean, I, no. what is the I'm more than happy to go into that subject. Of, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, it, it, just because it's unsuccessful doesn't mean that you didn't spend a considerable amount of your PhD on it. It's part of your dissertation. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a whole chapter, right? Like mm -hmm. all of these things, there are learnings in there. I think I'm sure it would be beneficial to someone later down the line. But um, basically, I just wanted to say it is a very important reaction. Um, it's obviously something that people look at and, and people have looked at in the context of drug discovery because of what Nina mentioned, that lactams are a valuable, you know, pharmacophore um, that people pay attention to. So, yeah, I mean, don't underplay it, girl. You you, you did a lot of work. Yeah. Your work was no, super I did. important. I think I'm just a little jaded, like having to uh, write the review and also, you know, working. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little jaded no, I, <laughs> and it's been a, it's been a minute I haven't talked about it in probably I think the last time I've talked about this reaction was in my interview for my postdoc which was in I want to say February of 2021 mm. so it's been three years yeah <laughs> oh my gosh it's almost to the day that's wild crazy <laughs> you would know you would know that <laughs> no. now I, was, yeah. I mean the last thing I'll say is when I'm looking I mean yeah I mean you're creating like two new carbon nitrogen bonds you have like diastereal selectivity it's pretty crazy, honestly. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I yell if, uh, you know, if people want to check it out, feel free, but CCR, yeah. looks really cool it, to me. You know, what I will say, actually, the, I think the most interesting thing about what I did was we had a lot of unpublished results in our group that, uh, based on this reaction that I ended up kind of taking the unpublished results and then taking, while we were working on the review, I kind of found a, a gap in the knowledge about the, the mechanism of the three component variant of this reaction. And there had been several papers that had published that had described the mechanism as one way. And I recognized that they were wrong based on the results that we had unpublished in our group. And so what I, one thing I was very proud of was that I was able to like, you know, read through the literature, find this gap, and then in not, I don't want to say prove, but support. Yeah our hypothesis of what we believe that this mechanism is. It's, it's a little bit, I would say, simplified because I think there is a little bit more complexity that, you know, we didn't take into con take into account. But like, for the most part, I believe 100% in that mechanism. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think that was a real, oh, is that a thumbs up? So does you your guys? Mac. Your Mac. <laughs> so does your Mac. Your Mac agrees yeah. with you. My, Mac, my Mac is with me. But um, that was one of the things I was really proud of, of my PhD, because uh, I feel like I was very much secondary on most of my projects throughout my time. I was second author on the projects that I worked on before. And I, this was something that I, was, I really felt was my own. I was like, wow, you know, I found this. I found what the problem was, devised the experiments, ran the experiments. I did what you're supposed to do in a PhD, right? Like actually contributing to the literature with my own brain. So it was, uh, it was a really cool way to round it out. And there was a review that was published recently and they highlighted my results. And also what's wild is I'm on the, I'm cited on the Wikipedia page for Mark Cushman, which is oh, crazy. Let's so go. I know. And I was like, what, what is going on? Cause I, it like shows you, if you look at the article, I think it like tells you where you're cited. It was wild. So anyway, you know, I am very proud of the work that I did, even though I don't remember all of it because it's been three years. But, uh, yeah. That's a huge flex though. Uh, getting on the Wikipedia page yeah. is a huge flex. I'm sorry. And it wasn't me. I swear I didn't do it. That would be wild. But like, because some people do that and it Unhinged. wasn't me. I swear it wasn't me. Yeah. Anyway. Unhinged. Yeah. How about you, Anna? Absolutely. How was your... Um, I... Okay. Yeah. I'm, I... So... I worked on something very different from Nina. So, like, let me draw. I, Wait, I'll, that's I'll, not I'll try to transition. true. Well, one second, yeah. one second. Let me let her land. Let her land. 
what better cook <laughs> what i really what i really love about re- nina's like dissertation and her research career because keep in mind like nina and i started at the same time in graduate school like i've been able to see her from first year all the way to her last year at uc davis and like at the end of the day, what I really appreciate about her dissertation is if you look at it, it's a very, very diverse, very, very like well-rounded set of experiences. Like she did methodology development when she first joined the lab. She did, she worked on a total synthesis. I don't care what she says about it having succeeded or not. Like that in itself, like you spent, I don't know how long you spent on it, more than a year probably, right? If I were about to think about year. it. About a year. It was about, about a year. year. On, on a total synthesis project. Um, so she gained skills for that. And then she rounded it out with a full-blown mechanistic study, right, um, at the very end. Plus, me- the- like, method in theory. Sure, sure. It, it's method, but there's a huge mechanistic component. She yeah. also learned computational organic chemistry in order to kind of support some of the mechanistic studies that she was doing. And, like, you know, she's a very well-rounded set of, I think, projects in her graduate studies. I did not have a very well-rounded set of projects in my graduate studies. I did very much so kind of like, um, I would say the projects that I worked on and I engaged it with the most were very like methodology focused with mechanism on the side. And that's something that like, I was very excited about pursuing when I first got into graduate school because the school of learning that my graduate PI and my undergraduate PI belonged to were the same school. It was the Dave Evans School of essentially organic chemistry. I say this, and this is going to be a long kind of terrain because if you trace, you can trace everybody, like all of the academics that you know, back to a single source, okay, usually. Um, because back in like the early days of chemistry, there just were less people doing organic, like there were just less people in academia. And there was also kind of, and there still is those big name academics that are churning out like, you know, 20 academics in their career, right? Like, so you have like the Macmillan school of like chemists that I'm sure nobody is going to love like that. I'm connecting all of them. One second. Pause. Okay. I pressed my button by accident. Um, (laughs) I'm sure nobody wants to be associated with their graduate PI for their entire careers, but you know, there is that association. You come from the Dave Evans school of learning. You come from the Macmillan school of learning. Maybe you come from the EJ Corey school of learning. Like essentially because you did that, it shaped a lot of like what you're interested in from a research, like um, topic perspective. And it also shapes a lot of like how you conduct research and how you influence your students. Right. So for me, I was always very cognizant of that. I, when I was starting my graduate um, research studies, it was like, well, this is very much so in line with the Dave Evans, you know, um, the papers Lineage. that I published are very, very close to probably what the papers of Dave Evans and students would be publishing. Um, I will say though, by the time I got there, I would say the, the, the amount of people doing that work lessened certainly. And it it used to be a huge like um, facet of organic synthetic research to work on the stuff I was working on. And I think it definitely shrunk by the time I, I got there. Right. So in short, I worked on the study of essentially diastereoselective nucleophilic additions to alpha chiral and beta chiral and sulfonyl imines, which is just to Big say, words. like, I'm <laughs> right. I, and I, I let me break this down a little bit <laughs> for the <laughs> listeners, because it really the, the functional group is fine. You know, like what people typically associate with this is the development of in the 60s, the Falcon model, the cram mm. model for um, alpha chiral carbonyl compounds, either aldehydes or ketones, um, etc. There's a huge push in the 60s, 70s, 80s to kind of elucidate the factors that would influence, you know, the diastereoselectivity selectivity of nucleophilic additions to these compounds. Okay. They would put, be published in really high impact journals. Like basically if you could come up with another, with a different model for nucleophilic additions to that compound, that's a pretty high impact paper at the end of the day for you, right? Because what you're trying to do is utilize a model system and develop that model, feed into that model so that it can be utilized later on by, I'm sure people, first year students in their synthesis classes that are learning about diastereoselectivity. selectivity, you're always gonna learn about the Falcon model. You're always gonna learn about the cramculation model, yep. right? 
Um, and the reason why is because you're probably going to encounter a problem like that in your synthesis at some point. And, you know, hopefully it's going to be applicable to what you're doing. I'm basically doing this in my graduate studies. Instead of for carbonyl compounds, I'm doing this for imine compounds. Okay. Specifically, you know, imines that have electronic properties that are very similar to carbonyls because you don't want to deviate too far from the original system that you're trying to compare it to. So the reason why a lot of my focus was on N-sulfonyl imines is because the sulfonyl group is very electron withdrawing. And what that does is it actually, you know, gets your imine reactivity very, very close to carbonyl reactivity. Mm. We all know that imines are less electrophilic than carbonyls, right? So the whole point, you know, but you can kind of tune that depending on the N substituent. Mm. I didn't know so that. So we started That's there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't I don't mean to imply that everybody should know that. But um, right, that good. is a fundamental, I think, assumption that people in organic synthesis really make when they're comparing like C double bond O to C double bond N. Sure. So basically, we in our lab were exploring this concept and we saw that you know, imine reactivity or alpha chiral amine react. What? Sorry, what? No. Why are you laughing at me? You keep doing I'm Shut sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry, honestly. It's- I'm actually, I'm like not even trying to do a thumbs up. I think like I've, I've adopted this Fran Lebowitz like <laughs> hand movement yeah. where like I have a thumb pointing out at any given time when I'm like talking <laughs> with my hands. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I'll be sorry. It's all good. So <laughs> basically we're trying to create new models that describe reactivity of alpha chiral and beta chiral imines. And the reason why that's important is because the Falcon on model and the Cramculation model, which are models that were designed for carbonyl compounds, they do not necessarily apply to imines. You, but that's the assumption you would make. If you didn't do the study, you would go, okay, well, the closest model that we have is the Falcon on model or the Cramculation model. So we're going to just adapt that. When you adapt that and you try to derivatize that to a different system, well, it shouldn't shock you that there are going to be different results, right? And as a result, you know, I spent most of my graduate career essentially kind of coming up with new models, coming up with new ways of thinking about chemical reactivity of imines specifically um, and how they might deviate from the carbonyl compounds. Because, you know, we are moving, I think, the reason why, very related to kind of Nina's comment about lactans, like molecules that are drug-like typically will have nitrogens in them. So having nitrogen containing targets is, this is something that the organic synthetic community is just moving towards. It's important to kind of come up with new methods of incorporating nitrogens. And when you utilize an imine, obviously, the end result that you get after a nucleophilic addition is some sort of substituted amine component. And if you can do a diester selectively, that would be excellent, right? Um, And I think I wanted to come back to why it's important to do the modeling studies, Hmm. because in truth, a lot of people typically in total synthesis will say, well, all models are, you know, not perfect models of the substrates that I'm going to be working on. Therefore, how valuable are they are? Are they to me in my specific context when I'm trying to target something that's really exotic or I have an intermediate that nobody's ever used before, right? To a total synthetic chemist, their options are to either look at a model and try to come up with educated guesses of how they want to optimize that reaction, or they optimize from scratch. Those are the two options. They, they start from the ground up. They do every single thing under the board. And the whole purpose of doing the modeling work and doing the mechanistic investigations that we do is to streamline that process for a chemist who's trying to access a target, Okay. I don't know if this is going to go over well with everybody who's listening um, and if they're going to be following, but, you know, if you want to start from the ground up, that is absolutely up to you. Um, But it would be nice to have a starting point, right, to give you some kind of understanding of what your system is going to do before you do that, like, you know, heavy optimization, because In graduate school, you don't have the time and the resources of people, let's say, in industry. You can't just throw everything under the sun at your molecule and hope that it works. So, you know, you really want to make educated guesses. And even in industry, you probably don't want to waste your company's time and materials to work on something that's already been worked out, potentially, you know, by somebody else who did the mechanistic study. So 
you know, in that way, I think that's where the inherent value of my graduate work is. Um, and that's something that I had to constantly remind myself when I was in graduate school because I, I was very envious of people doing total synthesis. I really wanted to engage more with other types of projects and other types of work. But I had to also look back at my work and go, okay, yes, I am contributing, but in another way, in a different way to the overall scientific literature. And that work is so important. And that work does need to be done by somebody at some point. And it's going to be me because mm. I think <laughs> I had the... I had the right training and the right skill set to do it from my undergraduate research experience with Keith Orpel, who was also a Dave Evans student. And that's a lot of the work that he does as well. So it was important to me to carry on that legacy. It was important to me to kind of like take the time to do that. Um, and so I hope I described effectively what I did in the bulk of my <laughs> time without, you know, Certainly. being too pedantic. Yeah, no, I think uh, well, yeah. one question I have about that is, as in, can you enlighten us on, are there any like correlations then if you wanted to model like these, it means like are there trends that one can take away then for trying to do nucleophilic addition to Tazla means? Like are there, or is it? Yes, I, I would I would say there's two things that you have to really think about if you're encountering a situation with nucleophilic additions to C double bond O or C double bond N electrophiles. And the first thing that you want to take into account fundamentally is reactivity. Before you even address selectivity, you need to think about reactivity. Usually these reactions are Lewis acid mediated or bronsted acid mediated mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of like, especially with softer electrophiles, because um, I focus mainly on the Hasomi Sakurai reactions, which was recently on the, um, which is recently, I think, a post on, I forgot the account for this, but I remember, I don't, I'm not sure if you're running it, Aiden, at all, because I just saw it, but it was the Instagram account that posted like the little snippets or one slide. Um, is on to Instagram or X or? It was on Instagram. I'm sorry, I have to take time to do this because I <laughs> it's all right. would hate to leave people hanging. It's like the synthesis edit or something. Um, synthesis edit, let me see. There's so many synthesis accounts on Instagram. They recently the followed chemistry us. Editor? The chemistry okay, editor? Okay, the chemistry editor, yeah. The chemistry editor recently put um, had a whole slide on seroselective allylations using allosilane reagents, and it's less commonly referred to as Hasomi Sakurai reactions when you're utilizing an allosilane reagent. So uh, I would say, you know, I'm going to reference it as both. And that you know, allosilane reagents are pretty useful because they perform allylations utilizing kind of a softer, inactive nucleophile. Like this nucleophile is usually not going to react with an electrophile unless you're in the presence of some kind of Lewis acid to activate that electrophile. So, you know, when you're doing this kind of reaction, when you're doing this kind of reaction optimization, you have to think very carefully about what you select as the activating agent, you know, whether it's the Bronsted acid or the Lewis acid, it needs to be active enough in order to pair very well with your nucleophile. That being said, if you're utilizing a hard nucleophile, such as an organo a metallic reagent, let's say you may not necessarily need an external, you know, activating agent that you know, nucleophile is going to be strong enough. And then there's oftentimes also some kind of shared reactivity. Not only is your organometallic reagent giving you that like, you know, strong nucleophilic character of what you're trying, like of the reagent, such as a Grignard, it's also sometimes acting in itself as a Lewis acid mm. um, to whatever you're adding to. So that's one component of it that you need to optimize for. The second component that you need to optimize for in, you know, especially in my case is selectivity. You know, I, I was looking at diastereoselective selective reactions and usually that's what people are going to be looking for in their, you know, synthetic work as well, because you you probably have a stereo center involved. Diastereoselectivity selectivity is going to be more about thinking, okay, about these models, you know, thinking about these, these stereo electronic models, such as the Falcon on models, such as the Cramculation model, first Plattner, all of these things that you learn in your synthesis classes, that's where it's going to really apply. And if you see these opportunities to apply them, it's going to save you a lot of work, mm. right? The last thing you want to do is try to optimize on something that 
somebody else proved like decades ago is not going to go well for you in terms of selectivity because you're doing something that's like antithetical to, let's say, the first Platner model, or you're doing something that's very antithetical to the cramculation model. Um, a good example of this is, let's say you want the cramculation product, but you ha you're utilizing a substrate that's a bad chelator, you know, that's not going to chelate very effectively, either because of steric effects or electronic effects. Like, then what are you doing? And you might find the right conditions to get you there eventually, but you're already starting at a disadvantage when you probably don't have to. You can maybe redesign your substrate to maybe you know, get around that and save yourself and your PI a lot of heartbreak mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, because ultimately what you want to do in a total synthesis is get to the end product. Yeah. Do you really need to reinvent the wheel to do that? No, you don't need to do that. That's not the objective. So keeping your eye on the prize, I think, and I've seen it happen with many, many people in total synthetic labs, which is why I'm able to kind of say this, you know, I didn't, I'm no stranger to that myself. Um, and so, you know, I think our PI likes to say like a day and I, I a lot of PIs like to say this, a day in the library can save you like months in the lab or something. Is I've that something heard. that's familiar to you, Nina? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like it's not like do doing a little mm -hmm. bit of background research, thinking kind of critically about what you're doing and what the transformation is will save you time. And it separates somebody who's just running reactions from somebody who's a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. That's something that I would really encourage everybody to like think about. Um, and that's the inherent value to us teaching those models to you. Yeah. Um, so I hope that sheds some general insight on things. Um, with Imin specifically, if you want to talk about my specific research, it's just that the reactivity is going to be different no matter what, even if you have an electron withdrawing group on the nitrogen. And so finding the right Lewis acid that has the right reactivity is important. You know, too strong of a Lewis acid, too strong of a bronze acid, and you might degrade, right, your, your starting material, or you might have cause other side reactions to happen. So you got to think about that. So that's the first step. The second step was the selectivity patterns we were seeing with imines deferred a lot from what we would expect if we were just using the carbon double bond O um, analogous electrophile. And so uh, I, I can't get into it right now, but if you read my first paper and my second paper, you will see. I kind of dive into those models and I can I present why you're seeing differences in selectivities. And more importantly, I present conditions that get you the specific the specific selectivity that you would want for imines as a good starting point for your optimization efforts if you are doing a diastereoselective selective nucleophilic addition to imines. Mm -hmm. um, so, and to bring it yeah. back to the Casanova Cushman reaction, Anna never Not wants this. to bring it up. She never wants to concede that the reason that her project was formulated was because we, the uh, previous graduate students got the opposite selectivity that they would expect using n tosyl alpha chiral imines. And so in the CCR, they were getting chelation products in the absence of a chelator. And so that kind of started this investigation of n tosyl imines. Because you might be wondering, like, why do they care about alpha chiral n tosyl <laughs> imines? And that's <laughs> why <laughs> the CCR. <laughs> it's utilized in the CCR. I mean, imines are substrates in a variety of different transformations, I'm sure. Like, I'm not. I know, but that's that I, where that was the conception yeah, of your project. That is. Just, historically, that is true. Like, that is the conception in of the, the Shaw project. lab. I, I would say that, like, it's not that I like to deny it or ignore it. That's not at all the case. <laughs> it's just that She wants to I, separate herself from it. No, it's just that, like, the way the project went, went so far oh, away from that. So far That left. I feel yeah. like it would be disingenuous to yeah. be like, yes, this is a direct application. Because if it was a direct application, we would have been doing it in the CCR. I would have run yeah. CCR reactions with the conditions that I optimized, right? Like, And yeah. that didn't end up happening for whatever reason. So now I yeah. feel like it would be just a disservice. To, I know, to, but I like to, to bring it up. the two. But yeah, that's, that's, I would say that the overlap between Nina and I is that we've done extensive work on imines. Um, so yes. In order to do this kind of, kind of work, like we talked a little bit about the methodology. We talked a little bit about, about the transformations we were intellectually studying. But in order to actually do the work, Nina and I have to make imines, right? Like we make these so many imines. <laughs> substrate synthesis is a undervalued part of methodology. And I, I, I'm going to say this on this podcast. If you are a good methodologist, like if you're a PI running a methodology group, the smart thing to do 
is probably go, let me see what methodologies I can create with substrates or reagents that I can just get out of a bottle, okay? Because I want to spend the time assessing the actual method. I want to spend the time looking at the actual transformation. Mm. Unfortunately, Nina and I worked on methodology projects that required oftentimes extensive substrate synthesis, you know? Not, no, no, mine were not, not Maybe not mine Nina. Weren't. Maybe not no. Nina. Nina was more like you could get it from a bottle in one step, probably. I mean, it was like two, 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 three steps, yeah. Two steps. I had to make substrates for my mechanistic studies that took me like six or seven steps sometimes to actually get to even the step that I cared about, <laughs> just because I needed to get to a model substrate uh, that I envisioned in my head and that in itself can be it. That's like what fifty percent of my PhD is really just yeah. how do I With get there? Synthesis. Um, the, the total Wait, synthesis you know, of like, your yeah. starting material, like uh -huh. that's something I hear. Of. The total synthesis, literally, of, the total synthesis of your starting materials. Yeah, is yeah. We said that a lot in our lab. <laughs> like, but but the utility of that though, just to like, just to round out why that's important. When you're doing, like, if you're developing methods, you're developing methods so that you can add to the chemical toolbox. We're not adding to the chemical toolbox to be able to use these on simple reactions. We're adding, or sorry, simple substrates. We're adding to the chemical toolbox to be able to use these in total syntheses. Otherwise, what is the utility of making these new methods other than obviously basic research, which is very important. We can talk about that. But for other chemists, they're going to be using it on complex, complex substrates and Arguably, I would say that our uh, graduate lab was, uh, the lab was methodology, but it was really methodology towards total synthesis. The idea yeah, was always yeah. that we wanted to use these methods to perform total syntheses of these complex molecules. So these complex substrates that Anna had to make, which were, were quite difficult. Like she worked so hard on making substrates. Like she got so good at making these imines. Um, like... It was tough, but it was very important because that is what allows them to be applicable to the more complex systems that would make them more useful for people. Right. So anyway, that's what I want to thank say. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, think, thank you. yeah, I, um, I, I, um, I, yeah, one, one thing I definitely want to say about that is, is, uh, kind of chemistry in general, kind of returning to form where it, everything's got to be so marketable now. So it's like, if you're a student out there who's thinking your research is not really that important, it's like, why am I even like doing this? Or like, like this organic chemical reaction, like, like bring it back to the fundamentals of like, of like this transformation, here's what, what we're doing it for. And like, don't worry about the marketability of it per se. That's something that I've, I hear yeah. a lot. Like mm -hmm. not everyone's going to have like nature science papers, whatever, but it's, just, just remember that you're you're trying to build foundational knowledge for other people. I think it's that's kind of important um, to remember for a lot of a lot of students. I'd say, um, but yeah, yeah, I think I, that's yeah. so important. I actually had to defend that in my qualifying exam mm. because what they were asking me because a lot of the times what they want out of your qualifying exam, other than to see how you think about problems and how you solve problems, is what is the importance of your research and how well can you articulate that? Yeah. Cause you're going to have, you are in, on some level going to have to market that, but I never think that we should discount research for the sake of research. And in fact, I feel so strongly about this. I hate that academia is so focused on marketability and is so focused on making sure that it has application because the dog's going crazy. They Can agree. Because, they agree. Because Dwayne, they're Dwayne, with me. Dwayne has the something to say. Dwayne, Dwayne, has Dwayne, is, to say. Dwayne is here with me. No, but the thing is, like, <laughs> with um, ac the point of academia is to be curious. The point of being a, an academic is to be able to look into the questions that you have that not don't necessarily have outside importance right now. You don't necessarily know what the importance of the things that you're studying right now right. will have. I don't think Mark Cushman really thought in his, you know, in the lab at UCSF when he was running his first Castagnoli Cushman reaction with homothalic anhydride that he would be making a topoisomerase inhibitor that was in phase two clinical trials, right? Going off because right you don't now. know, <laughs> right? I know because the thing is, like, we focus so much on things needing to be marketable and that we need to make sure that, you know, we fake that organic chemistry, we're doing this for the biology of it because that's the only way that you can market organic chemistry. Why can't we just do organic chemistry for the sake of organic chemistry to learn more about how molecules react with each other? I'm getting so worked up. You're I'm so cooking. sorry. But you're like, cooking I mean, right no, no, now. You're fine. no, please, please <laughs> you're preach to the choir. Preach to the no, choir. Because like, 
we should be like, the more we focus on marketability and funding, the less curious we become and the more pigeonholed we become. And, and I think that that's what causes, I need to be careful with how I say this, (laughs) but you know, like, I just think that we are losing sight of what the point of academia is. The point is to learn. It's not to churn out people that you, you know, that are getting results so that the VI can get funding and get a Nobel prize. The point is to educate and to broaden everybody's knowledge of the subject. And that trickles down into society. I'm going to stop. I'm very passionate mm. about this. No, no, no. I, I, here's what I will say. Here's what I will say. I, I think if this is like a snippet of like, if we can kind of hijack this podcast and make it kind of basically doctors for a brief Let's minute go. so that I can- Go ahead. The, the platform is here, yours. Here is what I think. I super agree with Nina. I mean, I come from the same school of thought, right? You know, I, I'm a very like, I'm, I get, came into this job, came into grad school. All I wanted to do was learn organic chemistry, be a better chemist, think about things deeply. And I will say, though, that some people might disagree with you, Nina, like that. Like, I know there are I've people gotten in into arguments with people about this that really, truly feel like there isn't a space for that, that all of science and this is the tenet of thought that they think all of science needs to be applied. And if we don't think about applications, somehow we're not being good chemists, you know, and I, I think mm-hmm. that the problem with that is that, of course, we want our work to be applied. The problem with this is that none of us, nobody here on earth can see the future. So how do you make that decision? You cannot see the future. You do not know where this work could be potentially applied, like somewhere down the line. Like a good example of this is like the Nobel Prize this year or in 2023 was given for partially for the development of RNA vaccines, right? Like, and that's part of the reason why like we get like... That work was done a while back, from what I understand. And like the Mm -hmm. person who got the Nobel Prize famously said that she could not get funding at the time when she was working Mm -hmm. on this because it was deemed not valuable enough. Okay. It was deemed not impactful enough. And now look at her. Mm. She did not expect Mm -hmm. it. She continued to work on this, by the way. She didn't stop. She continued to do this despite the fact that she didn't get funding. And like, I believe Catalin Carrico very famously is somebody who she was early in her career and studying what she was studying, Mm -hmm. did not get her flowers necessarily. People didn't really believe in what she was studying. And there was no way to really act. I think at the time when she was studying this, there wasn't even an envisionment of an mRNA vaccine. So like, how can, how can you, if she stopped what she was doing and just was like, I'm not like, this isn't important enough. No one this cares. Isn't sexy enough. No one's going to care about mm-hmm. this. Like we wouldn't have had such a huge success in dealing with the pandemic of all things. Like you just cannot like predict this kind of stuff. And th- I think mm-hmm. that's the problem with that mentality. It's not that I feel like you shouldn't think about applied sciences. Applied sciences mm-hmm. is really important. We have real problems currently that we need to solve. Yeah. But the fact that we are not going to appreciate science for the sake of science. That's not okay. We should have both. Like, I think that's what Nina and I want, right? Well, And furthermore, my, the way that I feel about this is that academics, the institutions are not supported enough, in my opinion, to make the advances necessary to prove the application of science. There's, I I know that there's turnover in industry as well, but there's constant turnover. There's constant training. The PI, the PI's goal, you're running a lab that is learning, right? So, so expecting a group of graduate students who are not fully trained to be able to make huge leaps in the application of basic science. I think, I think it's short-sighted. I don't know. I, I mean, I think that that is the, there's not enough money in academia to be able to make the leaps in application as I mean, and of course you can, you can. Okay. I'm not saying you can't. I just think it's better suited to industry to be showing like the real utility of these things Mm -hmm. and actually making it useful in a way that we can actually use it. I know. I definitely, I I, I definitely agree with, with what both of you are saying. I've talked to many professors like on the podcast before about the state of funding, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, Paul Chirik, Dave Nechevitz, like all of these, all these people. And it's just, 
it's a it's 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 a delicate thing because I think you know you can kind of get let's say fundamental science research from the NSF. The problem is that major companies are the ones providing the funding, right? So big pharma, um, oil and gas, mm -hmm. um, they're the ones that are providing the funding, so they want to see the applications of it. And like, I'm, listen, I'm broadly yeah. I'm broadly generalizing, but <laughs> that's just you know, come after me if you think I'm wrong, but whatever. And yeah. um, and so they want to see the applications of it. So you know. It's a, it's a delicate thing. And so if you want to get funding, you have to kind of make it marketable. You have to make it seem, you have to actually get the investors to go. And I could, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this. I'm not, and I'm not trying to be um, facetious here, but you know, are people that are granting the funds, the funds, I assume they have backgrounds in the chemistry and the science or so. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they're shaking your head. I don't know. Well, I, I, don't don't know. know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. know. <laughs> like I would, my presumption is they would have some people who are giving the grants and funds I would presume have backgrounds in these sciences to like warrant, let's say who gets what, but I, I don't know how, I don't know if that's true. I, like, I don't, I don't really know. Mm. I, it, I mean, I would say that it depends like in NIH, NSF, like these government based or federal like funding agencies. I, I, I don't know much about them in terms of like what the panel of decision makers would look like. I'm assuming they're more close to the science, if anything, with the background. Mm. I'd say that in the age of biotech and then the age of kind of pharma, I mean, pharmaceutical companies have always been around or have been around for a long time. But in this age of biotech specifically, there's a lot of venture capitalism. There's a lot of money flowing in from all sources. And I would say that there isn't necessarily always going to be somebody with a scientific background in control of that money. The money is coming from somebody who probably isn't of that background, but they want to invest it into biotech because they see a lot of money making potential in biotech, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, so I think in that context, I can speak to the fact that there may or may not be somebody who has a scientific background and making decisions in the money. Um, and that's where the kind of like capitalistic perspective, I think what you're experience, like what you were communicating in terms of industry comes into play because for them, they see numbers. They need to see an mm -hmm. outcome. They need to see a return on their investment. And that's what's important to them. That's part of their job. Um, scientists are working within that con like within that system. And the training that we get is, I think, you know, in academia, it's usually from a learning perspective. Like we want to learn more about something. And when you transition into something that's more industry-based, you now have to think about goals. You, you can't just think about the process. You know, you're always going to learn something in the process. But the deliverable is going to be the thing that's most important. And the deliverable isn't just, we learn something new. Mm -hmm. That can't be it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. at least in the industry setting. If, uh, that's, that's my two cents. If there's anyone that's listening that knows information about this, please let me know, is like, or let us know. Cause like, I would love, yeah. I would actually would love to have someone on and talk about this. Like, how does, how does yeah. the, how does funding kind of work? And funding. how does, who, who gets what? I would love to have an open conversation about that with someone. Um, so this is an open invitation yeah. to anyone. Please enlighten us uh, about this. Who's interested? Um, I also think yeah. that, you know, to Nina's point about academia, like, you know, it's so dire now. You can see how dire it is because if you take a look at the chemistry faculty that is in your department, take stock of how many people are potentially getting into a biotech gig or potentially getting into a mm -hmm. side hustle or starting a company or doing whatever it is, trying to market their research in a different way. Just take a look at it. And I, and this is not inherently a bad thing. I think it's good that academics want to get into like a more industrial side of things and a more applied side of things. But I think it's grown a lot since like mm -hmm. over time, the amount of people that have done that this and are doing this and who potentially are going into academia to do this. And I think that's an interesting like switch because what it says to me is that it's not enough to be in academia and do research without that component. You know, going the extra mile or trying to market your research into something that you can industrialize or make into a company, like I question, maybe it's because the standard of living, what academics need to do in order to get the level and what they receive in compensation just on their own, mm -hmm. like might be lacking in some ways too, that they need this additional side hustle. The same way that like millennials are like marketing and like basically um, 
monetizing anything that they have right now because like we're in a crazy (laughs) we're just literally (laughs) just trying to pay the bills like I'm like I'm posing a question like are Mm -hmm. the academics right now just struggling with that are they okay are they okay (laughs) that they need the side hustle as well you know what I'm saying it's always good to have a side hustle I'm not discounting that as a millennial it's important to have a side hustle I, I understand this, but that's, that's something that I think about when I see it. Well, especially um, for young academics, like, um, let's yeah. say young professors, like, I mean, I can't even imagine trying to start a family. I got to get a house. I got to get a car. I got to run this research group. Like, it would just be nice and if I were- nobody's taught me how to manage. Right. So, you know, <laughs> it would be nice if I'm like, if I could, you know, if I were financially compensated and if that means, um, you know- through whatever means I get it. Like I get it, you know? Um, so. Um, yeah. And also sometimes you can financially manage a lab through like some of that as well. Mm. Like you can, it, it's a synergistic relationship between the research that's happening in your lab and the research that's happening as part of your company, in my opinion, like that there's, there's a little bit of shared resources that you can have access to, not necessarily money, but like, you know, supplies, information, mm-hmm. things like that, that I think can help bolster not just your lifestyle. It's not just a lifestyle thing, but also help with the longevity of your lab. You know, that's something that I would say is possible as well. One thing I also wanted to ask you guys, and this is we're gonna probably change subjects here a little bit, but, no um, you know, you guys have years of experience of synthetic methodology. I would love, I'm sure a lot of students would, would love to know things that kind of kept you guys efficient? Like what were some things you guys did the day to day that like made your lives much easier or much more efficient chemists, let's say? Um, I'm sure like a lot of people would love to hear from you guys about that. Um, uh, I'm the efficiency expert. Mm. I try to be, but I mean, I'm not, I wasn't, I was okay at it. I mean, if there's nothing, that's also great too. (laughs) No, there's, there's a lot of things to, to think about. You know, one thing that I do highly recommend, this is not necessarily about efficiency, but I think that, I think it's really important for students to get in the habit of reading papers. And I know that of course, everybody is going to say that, but you should read papers, not just to make sure that you are keeping on top of what's going on in the literature right now, but also reading papers will teach you how to write papers Mm. and even further it, it will show you how not to write papers, okay? So if you get, if you, I I really think that a lot of scientists, that's rude. I think that there are some scientists that struggle with communicating their research well. And I think that learning how to communicate your research, I feel so strongly about scientific communication, guys, but reading papers and learning what you like and what you don't like and how you can apply those things to your own research, maybe you know, reading the papers and learning how they actually conducted their projects and applying that to your project or like, you know, there's just so many things you can learn from papers. Right. And I think that I wish I'd read more papers when I was in graduate school. I I did, of course, everybody reads papers in graduate school, but I wish I had read more. So that's one thing. Anyway, Anna, so, you were going to say something. Uh, and, and to add on to that, because yeah. I think that's a great Let's as a starting point, I received Mm -hmm. some advice recently that I feel is amazing for reading papers specifically, because one thing that really got me down in terms of my keeping up with the literature is like you get overwhelmed, you know, with the amount of literature Mm -hmm. that is out there. Now, depending on your concentration, pick, you know, three, a handful of journals essentially that you really want to keep up with. And the advice that I got that kind of was life changing for me is that only read the ASAPs of that day when you're doing your lit reading, okay? And if you Mm -hmm. miss a day, do not go back. Mm. Just read the ASAPs of the day. Do not go back. It doesn't matter, okay? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, reading literature is about staying up to date. So going a week back is not going to serve you. Yeah. And I think as students and as like, you know, people, academics, we we're very completionist. We want to like tick off that box. Like mm-hmm. we've read every single paper that year and stuff and that's fair, but because that's an unrealistic goal that you probably will not meet um, because mm-hmm. there are going to be days that you miss, you know, mm-hmm. like 
don't let that hinder you because you'll get so discouraged because you missed all those papers that you stop reading. And that's actually the thing that you want to avoid. So I feel like- That's how, what I, I would get so anxious and then I would be like, okay, I I don't know like how to even keep up with that. But also in that context, like I think if you're not already using an RSS feed and like if you, one, using like a reference manager where you can save papers that you want to refer back to- and having an RSS feed that actually puts all of the ASAPs and like you can use Feedly or whatever that shows you the abstracts of that day and keeping on top of it that way. Um, also, like I recommended this on our podcast, but I highly recommend everybody read How to Take Smart Notes. Um, it'll help you with your literature searching. And it I it just basically the idea is like you should, if you're reading a paper, you should take notes on it. You should, you know, highlight things, make sure that you can actually absorb things from it so that, and kind of create a repository of notes so that you, that doesn't just go in your brain and escape you. You'll always have it. Let's do an know? episode on our podcast about reading papers. Yes, that'd be a we should. I think episode. that yeah. would be a really good well, episode. I have a, my entire job is reading papers. I have exactly. so many feelings <laughs> about reading and writing papers and we, I'm like, I'm, I'm ready. So this is just it. a sneak peek. If you guys want to yeah. know how to read papers, mm-hmm. listen, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. get you ready in a minute. Okay. Hang on guys. I um, really yeah. have to pee. Hang on. Give me a sec. Put a pin in this. <laughs> Put a pin in this. Okay. Pause. Put a pin in okay. this because I'm gonna come. Iconic. I wanna, Iconic. I wanna, yeah, I wanna, go, 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 go. I wanna um definitely come back to this because I have a couple questions for you okay. guys about reading papers. But I'm gonna let you guys hold on the fort. Okay. I really have to pee. Hang on, be your back. Okay. Yes. Well, oh, we'll right. hold Perfect. down the fort. Yes. We'll be here. Okay. <laughs> okay. In the meantime. In the meantime, I feel like I'm doing. You know what I was gonna say that we didn't say earlier? <laughs> what? Let, if you want to know about basically doctors, which is our podcast. We're basically doctors, not just because we just we basically just finished our PhDs and we're basically doctors. We're also basically doctors because we're not medical doctors. So we're just like, we're just basically doctors. We're doctors. We're not that kind of doctors. Not that kind of doctor. doctor. But also if you look at our logo, it's like a pH 14 because the other idea is that we are basic. We are basic girlies and you can be a basic girly and you can also be a scientist. And so that is what we like to portray That's with with our fuzzy pink mics and my pink hydroflask. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's a part of our brand. I love that Aiden left for for to take a little bit of a break and we're yeah. just going to this is our ad. This is our official this basically our ad. doctors <laughs> ad moment in the podcast if you're listening. Um yeah, yeah if, you're listening, and I are just if you got this far. Two crazy doctors, basic doctors that talk about random topics sometimes. sometimes and usually. yeah, we'd be really happy if you wanted to join in on us. Be a part of the conversation with us. Send yeah. us you know, things to talk about via DMs or on our Shameless YouTube channel. plug. Shamelessly plugging our, I mean, I don't know. Aiden's really nice. Aiden, Aiden yeah. let us shamelessly plug on his podcast. Yeah. It's okay. Oh, he's here. Aiden's <laughs> back. Okay. This is perfect. Yeah. Bro, I, I've been drinking so much water recently. Stay hydrated, everyone. That's, That's good. good. If you're not drinking, yes. if you're not drinking like a hundred ounces of water a day, you really should. Um, this is your uh, reminder to drink water. Yes. Yeah. Anybody who's listening. If you're a chemist, listen, you should be carrying around a water a water bottle. Stop buying plastic water bottles mm-hmm. and buy a water bottle and drink like three of them a day. Um, extremely important to stay there hydrated. There she goes. Because I swear, people be forgetting to just – you'll be working the lab for like yeah. four or five hours at a time. You just don't even drink water. You don't eat either. And we weren't mm-hmm. allowed to drink water in our lab. Well, not like way. literally in, in our, the lab, but like yeah. – no, 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 no. But this is – to your point, you forget yeah. because like you are in the lab and you're not allowed to drink water. Oh, yeah. So you have to leave physically the lab in order to yeah. do so. So this is especially well, important. And our, our desks and graduates – oh, both in my grad school and in my postdoc – our uh, desks were in the lab. So you had to physically leave, not just your, the lab, but also your desk to be able to drink water. Mm, so that was a bummer. There you go. All right. Um, so hang on back to reading papers then, because maybe we could mm-hmm. briefly talk about our, how we read papers individually. So like I, so to, to testament to you, what you guys were saying earlier, I do have mm-hmm. Feedly. That's how I get my, mm-hmm. and I follow like, I don't know. I don't know. I follow like Orglet, Jax, Science, um, what else? Organometallics, mm-hmm. ACS catalysis. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes, listen, sometimes you get busy on a Wednesday or Thursday, mm-hmm. like myself, and well, shit, I ain't reading the literature today. And I come back on a Friday, and all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I have like 200 articles. It's like, yep, I'm not getting to any of these. And, mm-hmm. you know, you might uh, feel good about yourself and pin an article 
and put it in your read later and you never will. So you're never yeah. going to read mm-hmm. it. So <laughs> don't try and kid yourself. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, maybe, you know, what are your guys's, let's say, um, methods for reading articles? Um, because yeah, like, like I mentioned, I'll maybe take an hour in the morning, not every morning, but maybe every three days. And uh, mm-hmm. I'll get to the articles of the day. If it's interesting, I'll pin it and read the, I'll, I will read the conclusion and the abstract. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. Unless it's important for my per- mm-hmm. research, I'm not reading other than, like anything other than the abstract and the conclusion. I think that's about all you really need. I think. Um, so I would say that's true, except figures. Mm. Read the abs. So I. Well, this is how I would read papers in Feedly. Read the abstract if I'm interested. Right. I open the paper. I look at the figures. Decide how interested I am in those look at the conclusion. And then if I want to read further, I'll read further. But like abstract is, for, okay, do I care or do I not care? Right. Great. Which is why you have to write a good abstract. That's what we're going to talk about in our own uh, podcast. Um, but read the abstract, then look at the figures. If you need to like kind of reference what's actually said in the text, of course, do that as well. And then the conclusion, see where they, and then if you get confused as you need as necessary, read through the paper, but that's only for ones that you're really interested in. Right. In my opinion. Yeah. I, I, like sometimes like I'll read a synthetic paper and mm-hmm. look, I know you guys put a lot of work in the, all the substrates, but I really don't care. So <laughs> I, yeah, I get it. Depends. Like, yeah. It, right. Right. Exactly. Like if you're. No, but you're right. Like, in a methodology paper, you probably don't have a substrate synthesis section really. Mm-hmm. And that's probably going to be in your SI. So I, that's totally valid. Mm-hmm. You know, that's totally valid. How about you, Anna? What's your, uh, like, um, so, okay. I'm chaotic. Fair. I don't have love the truth. Let's go because, because, and this is why I don't like something reminding me that I've missed papers. Mm. So I don't, <laughs> I, like, I, do lingo. I swear. I don't, I don't, oh, really? I'm not about the negativity. I also don't like being controlled mm. by <laughs> like, I just don't like, um, I'm just a very, this is very characteristic for me. That is like, crazy. Nina loves that stuff. Yeah. Like Nina loves I it. Do. That's this kind of stuff that keeps Nina in check. And for me, yeah. it's just such a debilitating thing to have to go somewhere <laughs> and be like, oh, you haven't read 200 papers. Absolutely not. I don't need you to tell me I that. I get that. So I, because if I missed a few days, I know I missed a few days. Mm-hmm. So that's why the advice about like not going back, not looking back, that works so good for me mm-hmm. because it's very manageable. ASAPs on a daily basis for, per journal is usually under 10 papers. So usually, okay. So like per journal, that's a manageable number of papers to have to go through. Um, I agree with Aiden that you don't necessarily need to follow every single journal. I uh, and it's hard to, because in grad school, it'd be different. Like today, what I'm doing currently for my job, I, I'm very focused because what I do is a very narrow, like essentially it's a very narrow subject, right? So I am not going to spend the time looking at things that are really out there. You know, I, to no stranger to anybody, I work in the pharmaceutical industry. So if I'm looking at Jax and an ASAP comes up and it's materials based, let's say, I'm probably not going to look into it right? Because it is the least relevant to what I am currently doing. So that's not a paper that I even take the time to read the abstract. I can tell from the title that it's not something within my purview. I skip it. I move on. You know, and what you'll learn, um, I do look at organic synthesis papers, total synthesis papers, methodology papers. The methodology paper I will look at if it's cool. Like if I really do think the transformation is cool, because And you can tell based off of the abstract, like, oh, this is a really interesting reaction. It's creating this bond or like accessing this reactivity that you really don't expect. Okay. Then I will probably take a little bit of time, check it out. And my goal with methodology is to be like, this is a possible transformation. This is a transformation that's feasible. I know this. I don't need to really look at how good the methodology is. I just need to remember that this is a transformation that you can do now. And if I need to look it up later, I know that, you know, um, total synthesis can be interesting. I don't really look at, you know, I don't dive deep into everything. I just look at, do I like the molecule? Is it a cool molecule? Is there a step in there that I'm really interested in that they were able to make work in the context of this molecule? Mm -hmm. And then the rest is really medicinal chemistry focused because I'm a medicinal chemist. And so I will 
do more reading these days on medicinal chemistry focused things. I didn't used to look at the journal of medicinal chemistry. Now I do. In graduate school, I never followed that journal. It wasn't really relevant to what I was doing. So I didn't spend the time doing that. So recognizing that as your projects change, that the list of journals that you're following also changes is good. You know, right now, the most impactful journals for what I do is not JAX and it's not science and it's not nature. These high impact journals will teach mm -hmm. you a lot how to write good papers, like what Nina was saying, because you have to reach a level of writing to get into those journals, but they don't actually help me with my research. When I was in graduate school, they didn't help me much either. They gave mm -hmm. me the context of what the, you know, like what is considered highly impactful work. They, they mm -hmm. educated me on that, which is an important perspective to have and nurture. But for my research, you know, organic letters. Okay. Orglet. Orglet. Orglet journal, journal of Organic Chemistry. Let me tell you something mm -hmm. right now. Orglet is great because there is a level of reproducibility to the methodologies in organic letters that you will see. Like you have – the method needs to be pretty well-developed to get into organic letters. So I'm into that. Um because I think they also have a scaled up component. If you want to go into organic letters, mm -hmm. like your reactions have to reach a certain scale threshold in order to think get there. I think it's one so, millimole. Am I crazy? I swear it's one millimole. I think millimole. it's that. So yeah. in that way, organic letters is a really good resource for that. Journal of Organic Chemistry is really nice because they focus a lot on mechanistic studies. So like they not only want you to come out with a methodology, there's a certain standard that they want you to reach in terms of the understanding of the reaction mechanism itself. Oh, I didn't know that. So what, That's interesting. Um, Yes. And, and here, get this, guys. This is something I didn't realize until it was too late from a publication standpoint. Read the, when you go to a journal, oh my gosh. read the journal's mission statement. Hmm. Read the journal's, you know, description of the journal. Don't just assume, hmm. oh, I know what this is about. ACS catalysis. Hmm. Oh, it's, it's about catalysis. No, every journal has a mission. Every journal has some kind of larger thesis that they want all of their articles to fit under. Mm -hmm. If you're targeting a specific journal that you want to publish, read that journal's mission statement. And then think about how you want to write your paper. Think about the experiments mm -hmm. you need to include in your paper in order for that journal to really, you know, say, yeah, I want to publish this. I want to include this as part of my, you know, catalog. Like, I didn't know that journals had a mission statement. I just was out here being like, organic chemistry, yeah, Perfect. that will go in there. You <laughs> know, anything with organic synthesis <laughs> is going to go into organic letters or JOC. Like, that makes sense. Not the case. Read their mission statement. They value different things. They prioritize different things. Um, and so and use that to, yeah. Well, they also have, like, submission standards as well. Don't just, like, willy-nilly yeah. send things as well. Right. But um, So... I would – so basically curate your list so that you know exactly which journals are the most relevant to you and what you're doing and, you know, have a goal in mind. Don't just read for the sake of reading, mm. you know? like Agreed. That's, also, yeah. you, there's a, a couple other resources that you can use. I know that SciFinder does this. If there's somebody in your that is a leader in your field, you should yeah. subscribe to uh, publication alerts for yes. their work. You can subscribe to publication. Like I still have, I still have a publication alert for someone uh, from our review, Anna. But anyway, so you should subscribe to, you can subscribe to people. You can also subscribe to topics. And so anytime something is published on that topic, you will be alerted because that's the things that you're interested in. And that's the papers that you absolutely should read because you need to stay up to date on the stuff that you are doing and that people who are I wouldn't say competitors to you, but that are in the same field as you are also doing so that you can ensure that you know what is going on. You want to know if you got scooped. Okay? Yeah, that's true. So that's sorry, but yes. you do. That's important. Uh, I've been scooped before. Mm -hmm. I have, our, our group has been scooped before, but I, I mean, it's okay. Yeah. It's just the way, it's just the nature of it. And then it's, it's also, yeah. it's not like it was unsurprising that we got scooped. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. Um, yeah. I do want to give a quick shout out. I actually don't follow the journal of organic chemistry, but maybe you guys are changing my mind. Maybe I should, but organic letters, man, this guy, that's probably mm -hmm. my favorite journal because everything is like five, six pages. I love like Orglet is <laughs> sneaky, um, sneaky, useful. Um, yeah. Oh no. Uh, okay. We lost you. So we don't know what you just, said. I was just going to say it's, it's just so useful. Um, yeah. Orglet. 
Um, it is. Um, JOC, like, uh, it's nice. I, I remember using JOC the most when I was preparing mechanism problems for group meeting, actually. Mm. Is oh, really? I did org led. I did org led as oh, well. Um, mm-hmm. I did org led and JOC for mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And so, it, it again, you have to have a specific goal. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. don't just, you don't need to read them all. Just mm-hmm. have a specific goal in mind mm-hmm. um, of, of what you want to get out One of it. One other journal I'm going to shout out. I'm not getting endorsed for this, but I just like it so much is Organic <laughs> Process Research and Development. One of my favorite journals now. Yeah. They have, yeah, they, great journal. like, it's just the utility of their, of their thing. And they also put out, I think it's, I actually don't know how often they do it, but they'll put out like um, OPRD items. It's like some items of interest. And it's mm-hmm. literally accumulation of like the best papers that I got released um nice. i love that so if you guys aren't following that just for the viewers go follow like oprd because like there's their yeah. their issues on some items of interest is is super useful mm. i love yeah. oprd i feel like the mm-hmm. really one thing that i didn't realize about that journal though that i want to give as a caveat to listeners is that if you're in academia specifically, or if you're a graduate student listening to this podcast, like you might be tempted to try and do the stuff in OPRD in lab. And it's kind of like, if you have that approach, it might, you might not get as much value out of it because what happens is the OPRD processes are adapted for very specific parameters yeah. that you may not necessarily need to have in lab, you know, at scales that you're probably not doing yep. in lab. Mm-hmm. So what might work better for you in practice might not be stuff out of that paper. It's still important to get insight about like, you know, how to do something better at a larger scale specifically. Like that's really important if you're at a stage in our project when you're doing that. But I, I run into problems, I guess, where I look at an OPRD procedure and I'm like, this is from OPRD. This is like a great procedure. Let me try it. And then I realize, oh, there's actually a simpler operative procedure I could do that could accomplish my goal without going to the OPRD one. And why didn't I just do that? Mm. You know, mm-hmm. because my goal and the, you know, process people's goals are different, right? right? So Very true. Yeah. it so just keep that in mind. It's a great journal yeah. though. I I do highly recommend. Oh, I never I never I, I like I I never do any of the transformations at, or like yeah. OPRD, but I just like <laughs> I just like their journal. Like, I got over really, a good journal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great journal. Also, one thing that RPI said, like when I was asking him way back when, like, how do you read papers? Like, what did you do? How did you do this? Um, When he was in grad school, he said that he would take a morning, like Saturday morning and just like bulk read. So he would just take the time and read all of the things that he wanted to read for a couple hours on Saturday morning. And that was his reading. So, you know, do your lab work during the week and then take people, keep it. Oh my gosh. Why can't I talk? Then take a couple hours to read it on the weekend. I mean, that's like something you could also do instead of trying to stay on top of it every day. Be like, okay, Saturday mornings or like Monday mornings before group meeting, if you have group meeting, like I'm going to take that time to read papers and that, cause I know I'm not going to get at whatever else done, yeah. but uh, that's another option. Yeah. I like that. I think, I think generally speaking, like you, you need to, um, a lot of time to do paper reading or like you should, yeah. um, don't just, yeah. don't just be like, Oh, I'll get around to it. Like, no, that's not a good, no, mm-hmm. don't. Like actually, you won't get around you to won't. it. <laughs> you will not do it. Don't don't lie to yourself. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. you need to take time. Whatever works best for you, take the time. Like block out mm-hmm. some time, literally, and do it. Uh. Mm-hmm. Especially if you do set up the alerts that um, Aiden mm-hmm. and Nina are talking about. Because if you're just reading literature to stay up to date, I would recommend doing what I do, which is just if like you know. I have kind of a routine um, right before lunch is usually like a quiet time for me at work and I read those papers. Um, And you can kind of work that in, you know, sporadically. And you don't need to be comprehensive. You don't need to read every Mm -hmm. single paper, so it's okay. But if you are trying to keep on top of like literature for your specific subject, like what Nina was saying, or if you're trying to keep an eye on somebody else who's really prominent in your field, then that's a comprehensive reading thing that you need to do. And as a result, you do need to set aside time for it to make sure you keep up with that. And that is a really good, like doing that on the weekend or doing that as, at a designated time is like a really good strategy to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I just keep in mind what your goals are, Right. Mm-hmm. you know, don't just do things because other people tell you to do things. Like think about like, does this apply to my goal? Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, that's yeah. how I feel about it. Uh, one thing uh, before we kind of wrap up, because we've been going for an hour and a half. This mm-hmm. is fucking fire. Um, I know. Sorry. You know why? Don't be sorry. We talk too much. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we do no, talk it's a lot. All good. I, I, yeah. It's all good. Say more with less. Um, you know? Say more with less. 
Um, but maybe some, I guess the last thing that, you know, I wanted to ask you guys about is, and you guys have covered this on your episode. So again, I encourage you to get over to their channel, but um, maybe like some things you guys did during uh, graduate school that helped with your like physical mental health. Like, are, are there any things that, um, that you guys mm -hmm. did? Because a lot of students get so caught up in the science that they're not taking care of themselves physically and mentally, which are more important. And also your relationships with, you know, friends and family, like those are the, those are the three pillars I would say before even doing graduate school. I don't know how much time we have for this, but yeah. maybe that was too much. I don't know, but uh, I definitely. It's funny because I've mean, been thinking about like ways I was efficient in lab, asking. and I feel like I have thanks like that asking. thought still in my head, but yeah. Well, let me start, let me start this yeah. with saying, this is one thing that I did, that did come up in terms of efficiency in lab, which I think also relates to mental health is like, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to just burn it all down and start from scratch. Okay. And I say this, yeah. you can apply this to several different things. You can apply this to a mm -hmm. reaction that you're trying to optimize, or you can apply this to a big project, or you can apply this to anything else in your life. But sometimes saving yourself time means actually starting over. Okay. Um, yeah. Ian and I have done this multiple times. We would look at each other in lab after we've been struggling on like a, a reaction or something for like weeks. And we would look at each other and we're like, we need to do a hard reset. And yeah. that meant throwing everything away. Don't not even, don't even look you because what happens is when you're screening a reaction, you're like, oh, I have these seven reactions and I don't know what happened in all seven mm -hmm. of these reactions. Mm -hmm. And what you can get really stuck on is I need to figure out what happened in these reactions. So I'm going to spend the time to do this. And then you realize I you know, a week later, you're like, I haven't figured it out. And it's depressing me because I don't know what to do now. And I'm confront like, I don't even know how to navigate myself out of this problem. Okay. Throw, throw the seven reactions away is what I'm trying to again. You. Just do it again. See what do happens. Do something else. Yeah. Do something else. Do yeah. something different. Do, do two reactions of the seven instead of the seven, throw yeah. them away, do them again. And then assess what you want to do because when you find yourself in that situation girl you in danger okay you in danger yeah. you need to hard reset you need to clean your hood because i yeah, know what it looks like after seven reactions <laughs> and it don't look good and you yeah. need to and you need to write in your notebook page for those seven reactions starting over yeah. Yeah. <laughs> reactions failed starting uh, over moving yeah. on forgetting about this yeah Important. you know actually yeah also, I think that like one thing that sometimes I would do and I always regretted doing it was always, always when you run a column, concentrate your fractions immediately, figure out what happened immediately. Have, mm. have, do, you're looking at me like you've never left your column fractions in your hood overnight. Me or <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I don't really run columns. I'm not really a synthetic. Oh, okay. I don't really okay. run Cause, like, uh, reactions. Like he's that. above that. I, he's above um, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an organo metallic uh -huh. chemist. I make catalysts. I don't really yeah, worry so about I don't really worry about fair. that. He's, he's <laughs> yeah. beyond that. I actually have um, an yeah. ISCO. I, I yeah. have a commie flash that does it for me. Mm. Well, yes, but you still have to concentrate those. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm just messing around. But yeah, uh, so, I, I think and yeah, it needs I think UV. That's a good point. That's a good actually, point. it needs UV anyway. So like, if it's not a chromophore, uh, then you can't even really use it. But anyway. Yeah, no, I exactly. But I, I also, so always running your column, like always, always figure out what happened with your column after running your column. Don't leave your call. If you can, don't leave your fractions because you never know what's going to happen. Mm. Um, In shoot, line with what that else. is, mm -hmm. you think about that. Never start a column on an empty stomach is what I always tell new graduate students because yes. this is why columns always take longer than you think. Mm -hmm. And to Nina's point, you should try and figure out what happened to your column, you know, yeah. that same day if possible. Um, taking a break after you run it, if you're really confident, that's fine. But mm -hmm. like, I think the reason why she says that is because if you leave them and you come back the next day, they're just things that you forget. So yeah. like you don't, you want it to kind of be fresh, but mm -hmm. you don't want to run a column on an empty stomach because I've seen it time and time again, a first year will come inevitably to my lab. I give them this piece of advice. They do not mm -hmm. listen to me. It is mm -hmm. 8 PM or 9 PM on a Friday. They haven't mm -hmm. eaten since lunch. Well, no, mm -hmm. in fact, they, they skip lunch because yeah. that's, that's where they're at. That's where their yeah. brain space is at. Okay. Mm -hmm. They skip lunch. They decide to start a column at 7 PM. 
They mm-hmm. say, my column Terrible will take an idea. hour. I'm going to go home. Why? Awful. And I'm going to eat at eight. Terrible That's not idea. true. Their column streaks. Oh. Their column is streaking. They don't yeah. know where their product is. They don't know if that product has come Life out. Is it is it's now all 9 over. PM. My weekend's ruined. Like, <laughs> yes. It is Life now 9 sucks. PM. And they're like, I'm so hungry. I'm delirious. And yeah. I have nothing to eat. And then I'm there like, what did I tell you? Mm. Don't start I told you on an empty yeah. stomach. You need to, I, and I always say this to them, like if you care about the chemistry, you need to take care of yourself because yeah. you're the one doing the chemistry. And if you're yes. not up to par, you're not going to be doing good chemistry. You're yeah. going to be making decisions that you're not equipped to be making. So what does that entail? You need to be healthy. You need to mm-hmm. sleep. You need yeah. to eat. Those things actually contribute to the science. Don't think Mm -hmm. that they take away from the science. They help Mm -hmm. with the science. If you're not doing those things, you make mistakes. You make mistakes and then you suck. Mm -hmm. And then and and then the science sucks. You have to rage quit. But (laughs) and then you rage quit. I tell people never I would say don't start a column after 5 p.m. There are some people whose whose um schedules are shifted, right? You know, we're not going to talk about how many hours you should work because that's between you and your PI. But that's between you and God. And then we're not a part of that. <laughs> okay. So like after 5 p.m., it, like and the, you're rushing to like go eat dinner, to go home, to go. Do, there's so many things that you end up rushing through because a good column should be under 20 minutes, but not all columns are good columns. <laughs> it's, you know, like that's the truth. Like you can run a column in 20 minutes, but you won't always. Mm-hmm. So you have to plan for that. Yeah. But the other thing um, that I I remembered what I wanted to say, and this is a regret of mine, I think I was actually much better than a lot of people. But your notebook is so important, okay? You need to... You need to treat your notebook like a diary, okay? You should, in my opinion, if I could go back, the things that I would do differently with my notebook, and I was pretty thorough, I would not only write what happened in the reaction and like everything throughout the entire experiment, I would also write why I ran that experiment because sometimes you ran a reaction and you actually don't know what your hypothesis was or what you were testing or what, why you were doing even what you were doing. Uh, I have a whole like setup for how I like set up my reactions, like my lab notebooks. And like, I have things that I would change now, but I always, you know, actually Anna was the one who like, I modeled some of it off of like, I labeled all of my stuff, you know, we had the stoichiometry table, I had the procedure and I didn't just have the procedure for like how you run the reaction, but also separating what the workup is, what the column conditions is and making, I would highlight it very specifically. So anytime anybody was coming to look at my notebook, they would be like, oh, okay, this is how they, the reaction was run. This is how she worked it up. And this is where the column was instead of like having to read through what nothing, or, you know, there was one notebook that I saw one time where somebody put the stoichiometry table and then there were four bullet points with nothing afterwards. (laughs) And I was like, it's in their head. Just go ask them. You gotta go ask that person. Yeah. Yeah. And then they leave and then you can't. So, uh, definitely treat your notebook like a diary. I think this is something that has been lost. And the reason I think it's been lost is, uh, there's, this was something that happened. I, I don't know when it happened, but for patents, it used to be that you it was first to first to discover, but now for patents, it's first to file. And this is my conspiracy theory. I think this is why this happened. But since that change happened where we don't have to sign notebook pages anymore, we don't need to be writing everything down anymore because it doesn't actually apply to our patents anymore. I think that's why that happened. Mm. But as a result, the the you know processing of lab notebooks has gotten so much worse i've seen old notebooks posted on twitter of like other academics from when they were in grad school i'm like there's so much more detail than anybody that i have ever seen in my time as a graduate student right. so treating your notebook like it is an artifact that will need to be reproduced rather than just stuffing it into your si and like expecting people to write the paper read the paper which they should okay but Use your notebook to its advantage. Right. That's that's what I would say. I I, I, I definitely one hundred percent agree with that. Because um, mm-hmm. and most of the time too, it's you're the one that's going back to looking through your notebook. So if you've run an experiment like a mm-hmm. year ago, it's like I got to try this again, and you didn't write down all those mm-hmm. minute details. You, you again, you can kid yourself. You're going to remember these details, but you're not. You're not going to remember mm-hmm. these details. You won't. And you're going to have to rediscover what you discovered a year ago. So just do yourself yes. the service, and just write down all the details. Um, mm-hmm. Don't clown yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, literally. You can clown everybody else, but don't clown yourself. One other thing. Yeah, I'm just kidding. One other That's thing about lab efficiency. This is just this is my pet peeve. Mm-hmm. Now I'm gonna dive into something real quick. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yes, All right. Let's go. Filing and archiving like characterization data. All right. I'm telling you right now. You oh, need mm-hmm. if you have so everyone's got their notebook. You got your maybe you have multiple books. Maybe you have page numbers. You need to be writing down the like your initials, your book number, page number. And I like to write down the date I took these NMRs or whenever I did the characterization, what instrument I used. And this is all like within mm-hmm. the file name. And, mm-hmm. and all of that kind of gets collapsed into my laptop. Because if you're like mm-hmm. trying to find NMR data that you took like months ago and you didn't properly mm-hmm. file it, good luck. So yeah, he, you're absolutely properly right. Properly filing all your characterization data is super critical. Um, Mm-hmm. I literally have a so my method of filing electronically these days is every every notebook page has a number has a file associated yep. with it now. So like all my reactions just have a notebook page with my um with the reaction name and then all of my data associated with that goes into that folder. Um and then yeah, there's when you're filing, there's no such thing as being overly comprehensive in terms mm-hmm. of like oh there's no such thing as being overly detailed. Mm-hmm. You you will always kick yourself if you're not detailed enough, but Mm -hmm. you will not kick yourself if you included too much detail. So I I definitely support and endorse what Aiden is saying. I don't know if like there's an, you can download an app because let's say you're, let's say you, you're really meticulous about um, all your characterization data, whatever the data is, but maybe you're not the best at like organizing it per se, but there's an app that you can get on your, in your laptop called everything. So you could like Mm -hmm. go into the everything app and then just find the data. So like, the way I work is I have my initials, my book number, and then the page number. Cause like I have, now I'm up to like three books. So mm-hmm. if I just do my initials, my book number, page number, it'll, it'll take me to a file in my laptop where everything that I've done was recorded for that um, characterization. Nice. And I don't do, I, I, our group personally doesn't do um, like online uh, notebooks. We have journals, mm-hmm. um, handwritten. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to find details about the reaction, you have to go to my journal. But the point is like all the details of the reaction that I ran is in that journal. So I guess long or short here is make sure you're very meticulous about how you do characterization and, and, and the details of that reaction mm-hmm. for your own self, for your own sake. Um, cause you will forget yeah. all the details. And- I would also say what you did is that's exactly what I did, but I will say you should always for your page number do up to three numbers. So mm-hmm. zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, whatever, because then it shows up this like in the correct order yep. instead of being like one, 10, 100 or like whatever, you know what I mean? Cause it can, yeah, sometimes this is it classic does that. computer science, like yeah. um, computer data management. I don't think, people really get any unfortunately i feel especially like people who are like i feel like the next generation they're not getting really clear directives on because like this is stuff that we learn through trial and error as millennials Mm -hmm. like we like literally also some of us built the system he's not a millennial no i know i know i know i'm not speaking that i'm just not speaking to that i'm just (laughs) saying that like it it, it is shocking to me no i love gen z i love them but what Nina is saying, going back to the notebooks, mm-hmm. this is a classic data management basic level tool. Yeah. When you're naming your files, do not just think about what you have in front of you. Think about how much how much data you're going to be generating for the amount of time you're generating it. And mm-hmm. then if that number is a three-digit number, you should have a three-digit filing system like 00X or 001002. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If that number is a four digit number, go to the, you could, again, you will never kick yourself if you over prepare. You will only yeah. kick yourself if you under prepare. So, yeah. whatever. That, right. that is that going back to data management. Yeah. This is really important. Facts. Going back to I mental health. I have so many feelings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mental health. Going exercise. back to mental health. The answer is exercise. <laughs> and yeah, I cannot overstate the, like exercise exercise with friends take a walk it doesn't need to be high impact there's differences between high impact and low impact exercise you don't need to go crazy is is the philosophy that i am adopting now just just do something Mm -hmm. right um i cannot overstate this enough get a therapist Mm -hmm. look look yourself in the eye and get a therapist (laughs) and i know that really at the end of the day you're gonna go it's too hard or i don't need it 
I'm doing fine right now. I'm a man. And I don't something need it. that it's like right. <laughs> Trust me. You need talk it. Talk to one of your talk to what talk to anybody in your life. Ask them whether or not you need therapy, and be like, "Can you be really honest with me?" <laughs> and then see what they say. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't have a therapist right now, most likely you're taking it out on somebody whose job isn't to be your therapist. And you should question mm-hmm. who that person is. Maybe that person is your partner. Maybe that person is your best friend. For Nina and me, it was each other at some point. And then we got real therapists, and that's why we're still friends. So we we <laughs> there are people with professional degrees for these types of things. It's yeah. surprising, and, I know. and of course there is a shortage. Like I'm not saying that this is a you know cookie cutter like solution to everybody's problem, but you know it's one possible solution. It's one possible thing you could be doing. And if you're a student, you probably do get some free sessions, so you might as well start there mm-hmm. in terms of how yeah. you're improving your mental health. Because like Aiden was saying. Like with journal reading, if you don't set aside time to do it, you're not going to do it. So you have to be proactive about it. And then um, the like the last thing I'm going to say is that I know this from personal experience because Nina, as a friend of somebody who's like this, she is always like, I'm totally fine right now. I have the capacity to do all of this right now. Mm. And then the thing (laughs) is like she over she optimizes her life to such a degree that there is no buffer room. Right. Because she's going to give all of herself to doing something. And she's like, I can totally handle this. But then life throws you Mm curveballs. Life will say, here, have something else. And she didn't plan for it. And all of a sudden it's in tatters. And that's what mental health is like. You can be handling Mm -hmm. it now. But if life threw Mm -hmm. you another curveball, you're going to be in pieces, you know. And then that's uh, trying to find a therapist when you're in pieces, by the way, much harder. Mm-hmm. than finding a therapist when you're doing okay. So if you're yeah. feeling okay right now, this is the time to find a therapist. <laughs> it is not yeah. when shit hits the fan, right? That is Thumbs not when shit hits the fan. Everybody? Wait, where's my confetti? <laughs> it's okay, it's not coming. Um, so anyway, but, I, I'm going to you know, get off my soapbox. Yeah. But, so my commentary is is really related to grad school and research. It's that you can't tie your self-worth to your research. You have to figure out how to perform your research and be okay with the outcome, whether it's positive or negative. Mm. It is so hard to do that because the results of your experiments dictate how long it's going to take for you to get your degree. It's going to dictate what papers, uh, sorry, what uh, journals your papers are published in. There are so many things hinging on your experiments that you cannot derive your self-worth from whether they work or not, because science is going to science. <laughs> like what science happens will happen. Science be so, sciencing. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it will be science. Uh, so, you know, you can't blame yourself. Sometimes stuff just doesn't work. Yeah. So you have to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Well, are you okay somehow. with that, Aiden? Do you feel okay with that and what you Bro, do? How good are you at dealing with that? Uh, like when shit doesn't go well. I, I listen. I'll be honest. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't have a therapist, but I'm also the type of personality where like I don't. Well, I don't know. I'll just be, listen. I'm kind of an open book here. I don't really have. I don't know really what I would go see a therapist for. You know, like I don't really. I don't. I really don't have like stress and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Honestly, wow, okay. what a life! Uh, what a life! <laughs> I don't, and like I don't, and like I don't, and I, I also like I'm not, I'm not saying this to be funny. Like I'm very serious. I mm-hmm. think that's because I know people mm-hmm. who have, you know, depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. and the stress. Like I take those things very seriously, and I can say I don't really have like, I don't really have those things. I don't really have, I don't really have those. So, um, yeah, and but you know, how do I? I don't know. You know what, though? Not to go down like a tangent, but I also think that they're unfortunately culturally men are taught to suppress their emotions yeah. so often. And I, one thing that's interesting for anybody who has gone to therapy, um, you'll find sometimes you'll go in and you'll be like, I don't even, you know, I don't know what I'm going to talk about today. And then all of a sudden you start, you talk, they ask you a question and you end up talking for 50 minutes yeah. about you didn't even know you cared. Mm-hmm. You know, you it's just know. getting, some, you, just had no idea. you didn't even know it's getting somebody to, to like care about you enough to ask you. And I feel like deconstructing the fact that men are supposed to hold everything in, I think is really important. I think, men, you know, not saying that you're like, I'm not going to project that on you. No, but sure. like, yeah, yeah. 
I want, yeah. Like I think it, you know, men should be allowed to feel Mm -hmm. anyway. I think it's, that's another conversation. I think that would, yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother, whole nother episode. Um, but yeah, listen, I, everyone needs to be in good standing with their emotions and mental health. And so Mm -hmm. just seek, however you need to listen, you can't do good science until those things are in order. Bottom line. There's just no, like, so Mm -hmm. take care of your physical mental health before anything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, try to have healthy relationships with family and friends, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's situation is different, but at least have people you can at least count on whatever that looks like for you. And then the Mm -hmm. science can come, I would say. That's just my general opinion of that. Yeah. Maybe stop romanticizing the evil, not the evil, the chaotic, burdened, stressed, depressed <laughs> genius. Maybe maybe we stop romanticizing scientist. Um, and associating like toxicity in life with brilliancy mm. in yeah. intelligence. Mm-hmm. Maybe we don't need like maybe we maybe we st- it's life isn't a movie, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. Maybe we can have well-adjusted scientists. Right. Maybe we can. Maybe. Um, so yeah, I think that. Oh, maybe we'll have a few feature episode and return to that point because I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Um, but, but we have a lot of feelings. This is why we started a podcast. Yeah. This is like this is just a reason to go check out your podcast because this is like just we're that's crazy. It, that's it. No, no, not crazy. Not crazy. Um, but in any case. Yeah, we've been going for a long time now, but I want to, Anna. I know. Anna, thank you so much for coming on today. It was super, that was really fun. I had a lot of fun um, today. And, you know, hopefully the viewers, hopefully you enjoyed it. Go check out Basically Doctors podcast. And, uh, well, I'll see you in the next episode, I suppose. Yeah, thanks for having us. Of course. All right, guys. This was so much fun. I loved it. It was All great. Right. Let's do it again.